the Israel lobby, you know, are, are obviously very much in favor of what he's done in terms of driving out uh, pro-Palestine opinion from the party. Um, so these are the people that he owes his position of, of, of power to if indeed you know, he wins the election, which is looking likely. So he, he can't suddenly tack to the left and do all this sort of radical stuff, which is going to transform the country because uh, his support base would, would vanish you know, in a second. Being a podcaster can be incredibly frustrating. You have so much great content, but no time to tell the world about it. And creating all the content for different social platforms can be exhausting. But I'm here to change all of that. Let Cast Magic change your life. It will analyze your podcast, create a transcript, and from that transcript, it can generate title suggestions, tweets, YouTube tags, articles, quotes, timestamps, a newsletter, LinkedIn posts, suggested clips for reels and shorts, and much, much more. And you can even give it custom prompts to ask it to write anything that you can imagine based on your show. Even better, if you follow the link below and use the code CASTING30, you can get 30% off your first month on the hobby plan. Cast Magic will save you hours and hours of time to let you do what you do best. Create great podcasts. Not much we can do about that. Okay, anyway. What can the Well, you're standing in the constituency, right? Me personally? Yeah. As a candidate? No, yeah. no. Oh, I'm, you're not? Okay. I'm not, and that's because uh, I'm in Islington North, which is Jeremy Corbyn's constituency. Okay. So... Uh, it would be a very strange decision for me to stand against Jeremy. Have you have you approached him by joining the party? He's aware of Transform. He was aware of the Breakthrough Party. He knows that you know there are um, groups of people who have sort of been pushing him to go a bit further in terms of making a clean break from the Labour Party and building something new. His attitude towards those groups has been quite cautious. Um, obviously, he's only just now. Um, declared his independent candidacy and he's sort of been forced to by the announcement of the of the general election um, after the general election he may get more involved in these efforts to sort of um, re recompose the left um, but at the moment he seems to just want to focus on Islington North that's pretty fair do you think he's do you think he's too old at this point to like get truly involved in that? Like he, what is he, 74? He's in his mid seventies, I think. Um, I mean, he's a very youthful guy. He's got lots of energy. Um, so I wouldn't say he's too old to sort of play a part or do anything. I think in terms of being the, the leader and the strategic lead for a new movement or party, it would probably make sense at this point to, to hand the baton over to, to someone else or to the next generation. But I think he'll definitely, uh, he could still have a role to play um, as, as a figurehead. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think maybe his name has become too tainted, but maybe not amongst the left. If he's to, to give his blessing, I think it would probably help whatever new movement emerges. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no other leader on the left really that has um you know his name recognition his power to uh inspire and inspire loyalty i mean he, he's the de facto leader of the left still uh in britain you know despite the fact that he's no longer leader of the labor party despite the fact that he's been kicked out of the labor party i think lots of people see him very much as a sort of moral leader even if he's not currently an organizational leader yeah so i think the best place to start is take me back to you said that Jeremy Corbyn radicalized you. That's right. What what did he yeah. say? He said some very basic things that I just wasn't hearing from mainstream politicians in 2015. He set out a moral vision for how this country could be different, for how we could change this country in quite a meaningful way um, rather than just making small technocratic tweaks around the edges. Uh, he had the integrity to say, 
you know, we can uh, eradicate poverty, you know, we can reduce inequality in this country. We don't have to tolerate things like rough sleeping, children growing up in overcrowded housing, crumbling public services. And, you know, these are all, you'd think these would all be uncontroversial things, quite basic aspirations that people would have for a civilized country. But actually, it says a lot about the state of British politics in, 2015, in 2015, following the new Labour years and following the coalition years, that just simply to hear that was a real uh, breath of fresh air. And, um, you know, it, it encouraged me to to support him, to join the Labour Party so that I could vote for him as the leader. Um, and that just got me uh, started on this sort of political journey, uh, finding sort of my place on the left of British politics, uh, going through the whole roller coaster that was the Corbyn years, and that providing a sort of um, uh, a sort of condensed form of political education, because I kind of had uh, not exactly a front row seat uh, to that whole experience, but I was living in Islington North, where, where I still live, which is. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn's constituency. I was active in his local Labour Party. At one point, briefly, I was the vice chair of Islington North uh, constituency Labour Party. So that whole experience of trying to support what Jeremy was doing and witnessing the factionalism within the Labour Party, uh, understanding the different forces in British society that were opposed to what he was trying to do, um, was a very, very useful political education for someone who, until then, didn't really know what was going on at all. Honestly, it surprises me that we see this drop in living standards. Or maybe not specifically a drop, but like no progression over the last 15 years. Yeah. It's been 15 years basically of real terms stagnant wage growth but wage yeah. decline. Yeah. And in my head I would expect to see a lot more like righteous anger yeah. in the world. Or in the country at least. Why do you think we don't see that? We do see it to an extent. Um trust in politicians is low. Trust in the press is low. I think in Britain, where, where some countries would have real obvious manifestations of anger, like people taking to the streets, like you might see in Paris or something like that, maybe in Britain it's translated more into a sort of seething anger that doesn't have an organisational outlet or maybe just a sort of cynicism or an apathy with politics. Lots of the people who were angry saw Corbyn's Labour Party uh, as a way of channeling that anger into something... Um, productive, constructive by engaging with electoral politics in this country and then they saw how that good faith effort to to bring positive change to this country was undermined by a variety of forces and I think lots of people have concluded somewhat rightly that you know mainstream electoralism in Britain is something of a con, you know something of a of a charade and so you know people don't really know where to go next um, by nature, I, I'm a kind of optimistic person. It, it's not enough. I, I, I can't really just, just sit at home and, 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 and seethe with, with anger. You know, I have to be channeling it into something. Um, so, so I've been involved in efforts in the sort of post-2019, post-Corbyn uh, period to try and, uh, you know, be involved in these attempts to to build organizations to the left of labor that can take some of the 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 energy the anger the hope the optimism uh from from the corbyn era hopefully learn some of the lessons from that era uh, and channel it into a new party which you know once it grows to sufficient size can try and disrupt the status quo and provide a real alternative mm. do you think a large portion of the public understand the extent to which like Corbyn was sabotaged from within his own party. It's hard to say. I think um, at the moment you've got this interesting situation in Britain where there's a big um, sort of informational divide based on where people get their news. Yeah. 
if I um, strike up a conversation with someone and they come across as very well informed about all the sort of um, shenanigans that went on during those days and how Corbyn was um, taken down from the inside, um, I usually assume that they're on Twitter and that's that's usually a correct assumption because it's very hard to get all that information if you're just listening to uh, Radio 4, if you're just watching Sky News, um, because, you know, it's not in their interests to reveal sort of what goes on within the Labour Party. So, you know, in my own sort of personal circles, I have people who who know all the, uh, the grubby details about uh, what went on. I also have, uh, you know, intelligent friends who, who are superficially interested in politics, but, but don't really know all of that because, um, because of the information sources. But I think, I think there's uh, lots of people out there who probably on a gut level, even if they're not super political, know that Corbyn wasn't really given a fair shot, but they might not know the details. It's, it's interesting. I, I saw on Twitter the other day that that poll that was just after the 2017 election, you know, where I think Labour were pulling at 46% to, to Theresa May's 41. Yeah, it's, it's the time when I think it was John McDonnell said if the election campaign had just lasted a, a couple of weeks longer, we could have won mm -hmm. because they were on that upward uh, trajectory um, as, an, uh, as a result of uh, Labour's 2017 manifesto, which was received very well. Corbyn um, performing in those debates against Theresa May and being able for the first time to actually get his message across to people unfiltered through the media, just, you know, talking to them straight uh, uh, on TV. Um, and yeah, that was kind of the high watermark, I think, of the Corbyn years. And clearly these ideas are popular amongst like a fairly substantial portion of the electorate. Yeah, absolutely. Why do you think Keir Starmer's been so adamant about like shifting back towards like uh, a more mm. centrist policy on in so many areas like he's just maybe he's not he's perhaps not gone as far as as say like he's, you know he's not he's not become like a, a full tory in in a red tie do you know what i mean but like a lot of these positions the positions he's taken up have, have shifted him quite significantly from where they would have been on the political spectrum under corbyn towards something that's much more like the Tories, despite the popularity of, of those policies. And, you know, the question basically is why, why do you think they would seek to run from that? Mm -hmm. And is that the same reason that they were undermining Corbyn once he was in and just the left generally within the party, even whilst Corbyn was leader and especially now? Lots of people call Keir Starmer a Tory in a red tie. I think it's perfectly fair. Obviously, it's a bit simplistic, but I think it really it conveys uh, lots, which is very accurate. Um, since Keir Starmer's taken over the Labour Party, I think his whole project has been about aggressively signalling to the establishment and to business interests and uh, the media establishment that the Labour Party is a safe pair of hands to manage uh, British capitalism, to manage to oversee the status quo um, and not threaten certain vested interests. And to demonstrate that to them, I think he's, he's had to use these very aggressive, crude measures. He's had to signal to them over and over again that he is really uh, eradicating all influence of the socialist left over his party. Um, you know, he did that right from the off, you know, whether it was um, firing Rebecca Long Bailey from the front bench for on a really uh, sort of flimsy pretext. Um, the sort of constant purging of left wing members, the deliberate alienation of, of remaining left wing members through just adopting this very uninspiring policy platform. Um, and just this continual policing of the left, I think it's all to show, to project this image, this tough man image, that the left is well and truly dead within the Labour Party. And 
everyone's got the message you know the message was projected unequivocally like i said i think very crudely simplistically the left have pretty much got the message because we've we've moved on uh emotionally from the labor party most people have you know we've, we've left the labor party we're trying to look elsewhere we're doing our own thing we we've concluded that the labor party is not um a credible vehicle for for the the transformation of society the media have got the message because they treat Keir Starmer very kindly with kid gloves. They don't, you know, raise all the thorny issues that they could raise every time uh, he's before a microphone. Um, they're giving him a very easy ride to number 10. So his strategy, which is very cynical and, and based, you know, purely on real politique rather than any sort of... Um, you know, um, well-meaning, earnest strategy to, to transform the country for the better uh, seems to be very effective. Yeah, I mean, do you think that he, that he has to do this? Or do you think that, like, do you think in or it is necessary for him to do that in order to win the election? Or do you think that that is his ideal, that he, he wasn't a fan of those policies and that he openly supported, voiced, and, you know, claimed he would stick to. Like, do, you th like, do you think he was forced to do this in order to become electable mm. because of the power of said vested interest that you spoke about? Or do you think that that's really his politics that are now coming out? I think sometimes there's a bit of inconsistency on the right of the Labour Party in terms of they, how they project their relationship towards... Um, pragmatism and realism and idealism sometimes they seem to suggest that deep down deep deep down well you know it doesn't rear its head very often they in a perfect world they would love to do all this stuff the mm -hmm. socialists talk about in a perfect world you know of course i would love to uh nationalize certain industries and uh you know uh give the nhs the, the funding it needs but although i'd love to do all that we're the realists. We understand that you can't do that or you can't do all of it. And actually you have to suck up to certain interests and you have to do what we're doing in order to get into power. And then you can do some of it. I, I don't really buy it because I never see, I very rarely see the bit where they actually give any indication that those policies are what inspires them or that they're really the reason they really get out of bed is because they might be able to make some progress towards that sort of socialist agenda really i think they don't really care about that agenda they have very little interest in implementing it um and they seem content to just take up this managerial position uh to be temporarily handed the reins when the Tory party has exhausted itself from its own internal dramas um, and just manage the status quo for a, a parliamentary term or two. And, you know, there, there is a precedent, which is the new Labour government, which Keir Starmer seems to have, you know, modelled his, his style of politics on quite closely. And... You know, most most people on on the left would say that uh, you know that was not a transformational socialist government. You know, they did they did some good things, but they basically um, you know they basically uh, continued the they did they didn't challenge the basic Thatcherite transformation of of society that had happened previously. They consolidated that, um, and of course they oversaw a basic economic model based on financial services that all collapsed in 2008. Um, so we have a recent precedent for this kind of uh, right-wing Labour government. You know, some people say to me, you know, maybe he's, he's actually a socialist and he's playing this really clever long game where he's just sort of fooling everyone into thinking he's on the right and he's going to govern on the left. They're, you're massively overcomplicating it. You know, we have a recent precedent with the new Labour government where Tony Blair said, We've campaigned as New Labour, we'll govern as New Labour. And they did. He didn't s suddenly turn into a sort of Corbynite socialist while he was in office. Uh, he, was a, he was a centrist and, and, and he governed uh, from the, from the centre, from the centre-right, I would say. Um, 
And the other thing is that, you know, it, it would be kind of structurally impossible for Keir Starmer to, to tack significantly to the left in office because who is his power base, his support base? He doesn't have uh, an organic connection with, with the masses like Jeremy Corbyn did. He doesn't have this um, large membership who, who are really invested in, in his vision, um, you know, under Corbyn, the Labour Party became, I think, the largest um, political party membership in Western Europe. It had half a million members. Um, that's hollowed out. That's been hollowed out deliberately under Keir Starmer. He's not really interested in that. His power base is um, the media class, um, certain business interests, um, the Israel lobby. You know, I've, I'm obviously very much in favour of what he's done in terms of driving out uh, pro-Palestine opinion from the party um so these are the people that he owes his position of, of of power to if indeed you know he wins the election which is looking likely so he he can't suddenly tack to the left and do all this sort of radical stuff which is going to transform the country because uh his support base would would vanish you know, in a second i think the um you know the israel lobby in this country is 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 very happy that mm -hmm. Keir Starmer has, ah, has taken sorry, over yeah, yeah, from yeah. from Jeremy Corbyn um obviously he's been uh, you know he's so hesitant to criticize Israel despite you know the the unending evidence of of you know atrocities that that we see on our social media feeds every day what do you think that is like, why are people so afraid to criticize Israel? Like, how how is it so difficult to just be like, lads, like, you know, you should exist as a country. We don't want to kill you, but maybe stop carpet bombing the place where you keep telling people to go to. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. like the, the barest of minimums. Like, you know, please just try not to murder like waves of children. Yeah. Like, why why is that so difficult to say? I think what it comes down to is that Starmer's wing of the Labour Party uh, are Atlanticists who believe in a very close relationship with the US. And I don't think they really believe that Britain should have an independent foreign policy. I think they basically think they take their lead from the White House. And if you look at how the rhetoric has changed over this period since October 7th, they're clearly just paying attention to what Biden says, at first, the word ceasefire was taboo. You know, you couldn't say the word ceasefire because that meant you were an anti-Semite. Then, you know, once, uh, you know, the, the images we saw started to, become, started to become even more shocking, they started saying ceasefire, but they were sort of framing it in a way where they weren't calling for an immediate unconditional ceasefire. They were putting all these caveats on that. I think I, think I actually saw a quote from someone, a, a Labour spokesperson, you know, we always get these quotes from anonymous Labour spokespeople, basically saying at one point, well, we're waiting to see what the US says on this. So, you know, they're, they're quite transparent about that. So for, um, for Keir Starmer or anyone on his front bench to come out with a sort of unequivocal uh, criticism of Israel on humanitarian grounds or, or more radical political grounds, that would set alarm bells ringing. It's completely opposed to that whole Starmerite strategy that I talked about before, which is just reassuring over and over again all these establishment forces, reassuring the White House that there'll be a, uh, a compliant partner in that Atlanticist partnership, uh, reassuring domestic corporate interests that they're not going to threaten them. So uh, it's not surprising to me at all that, that Keir Starmer, famed human rights lawyer, has not taken a strong stance on what's going on in Gaza. Mm, yeah, I think you could be right about them following US lead. That, that's probably the most likely explanation for their lack of action, essentially, or their lack of condemnation. I, that, yeah. Which is sad, because why do they, I feel, why do they feel they have to like, out so much to the White House? Like, realistically, we're not this beautiful, like, we're not two allies on equal footing. But at the same time, they're not just going to suddenly stop, like, dealing with us because we said maybe don't murder loads of kids. I mean, you're raising big 
geopolitical questions about you know <laughs> what is what is Britain's role mm. within the world system. Uh, how does the Labour Party relate to that? Um, you know, I think you know we saw this with Blair. I think uh, you know the Labour Party basically thinks Britain has to be um, in lockstep with the US or we're nothing. You know, um, Trident policy is sort of very much linked to uh, us us having security guaranteed by the US. Um, I don't think. You know, the, the Labour Party is very interested in in challenging that because uh, there'd be so many radical implications from that. Mm. Yeah, I mean that's maybe a bit deep for them to get into. <laughs> yeah, they don't want to rock the boat. That seems to be the biggest yeah. the biggest thing. So, so basically, since um, Corbyn's left, we've seen Keir Starmer edge further and further from from him. So that leaves this big gaping hole in the left. Yeah. No, on the camera that probably looks like the right, but this is the mm -hmm. left. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think is going to fill that? Because, and do you think that's going to have a significant effect on this election? Because it looks to me like the the Tories are just the the, the Keir Starmer is not going to win this election. He's just going to not lose it. The to it's like the Tories could they they could say anything at this point and yeah. no one will vote for them. Like <laughs> I don't know a single person and I know lots of like Tory voters that just are like no, why or I I I don't know who to vote for. Um so like what do you think is going to be the impact of that sort of abandonment of the left on the Labour Party's electoral result? I think um, Team Starmer has made a very cynical calculation that they can win this election simply because of the apathy that people feel or the uh, contempt that people feel towards the Conservative Party after 14 years of of decline, but also just the last last few years of um, Boris Johnson, Partygate, the list trust, mini budget, etc. Um, I think so. They've they've calculated that they can win the election despite alienating um, core groups, which traditionally have been perceived as natural Labour voters. Um, thinking about the left. I think minorities, uh, black and Asian people, who, you know, many of whom will be just disgusted by everything Keir Starmer stands for, and particularly his, uh, you know, pathetic response to Gaza. The poll suggests that that cynical calculation will be correct. They're predicted to win, you know, massive landslide victory. I mean, who knows whether it will actually be the massive landslide that is predicted, but I think everyone thinks that Labour will win. What will be the result of that? It's kind of a hollowing out of democracy because I think that the turnout will be quite low and there's no great oh, really? enthusiasm. You think, so you think, well, you think, like, you don't think there's going to be a great number of people just deciding they're going to vote for, like, come out and just be like, get these fuckers out of this fucking, like, parliament? You, you, you uh, I think, think that the people who, who usually do turn out to vote will think that. I think there will be a, a big get out the Tories mentality uh, among people who do vote. Um, I think there are lots of people who, who simply won't vote because they're not, they're not enthused. They're not motivated by, by anyone. And, you know, that's, that means our democracy is not in good health, mm. right? I mean, it's a bit like... Um, you know, in 2001, we had a very low turnout for New Labour's second uh, landslide election victory. And so you see what happens when you have a right-wing Labour Party who are maybe presenting themselves as more competent than the Tories, but are basically not uh, inspiring anyone with their, with their message. Um, we will hopefully see uh, some instances where Labour are really challenged or indeed defeated in certain seats by uh, well-run independent campaigns, left-wing, pro-Palestine, uh, community-based candidates who can actually 
galvanize people to get out and vote for something positive. Um, but it's going to be a bit messy because obviously the left is still fragmented. Um, at the Transform Party, we're going to be um, standing a couple of candidates ourselves, uh, only a couple in this election because we're very new and uh, you know it involves all sorts of uh, knowledge and expertise and, and personnel to to really meaningfully engage you know in the general election campaign um, but we're also working in a really constructive way with lots of the different groups that have sprung up in the last year or two in response to this gap on the left and just trying to navigate that complex landscape endorse certain candidates, direct our members towards supporting certain uh, independent candidates, like obvious ones like Jeremy Corbyn in Islington North, Andrew Feinstein challenging Keir Starmer in Holborn and St Pancras, and, and people like uh, Pamela Fitzpatrick in Harrow West, you know, again a, a socialist, pro-Palestine candidate who was actually kicked out of the Labour Party for being too left-wing. Um, so I hope that uh, at the next general election, after one term of Starmerism, I hope the left has got its act together a bit more, and it, and there's less fragmentation, and there's one, there's there's more unity and and more of an obvious choice for people uh, at the ballot box if they want uh, a sort of left of Labour anti-establishment option. Mm. Like, do you do you think six weeks is long enough for some of these? candidates to, to make like a real impact even locally because obviously like it's very much the I think the places where they're going to succeed are going to be you know where they're in the grassroots right whether they're, they're actually making like an impact on yeah the the knocking on doors like the get out the vote effort. yeah like that's that's where it's going to be won for a lot of those candidates right yeah left wing independent candidates and small parties like transform they're really reliant on time to door knock you know and, and people power because obviously they they don't have the mainstream media uh and, and corporate backers behind them so i think uh lots of us on the left were probably hoping for uh, a general election later in the year in the autumn yeah which would have given us more time um but then again i think now that it's been announced there is a sense of excitement and it's forcing people to get organized and do all the all the things they they needed to do anyway and let's not forget you know some of these candidates if they are truly rooted in the community as they say they are they'll already be known you know uh, sam gorst for liverpool community independence in the northwest he's not suddenly rocking up with six weeks to go and saying hi i'm sam i'm a socialist vote for me yeah uh, these people are you know in, involved in their community doing litter picks going on pro-palestine marches doing all sorts of stuff day in, day out. So hopefully they'll already have that um, a level of support there. Mm. Do you, Andrew Feinstein, by the way, if you're watching, I want you back in the show. Mm -hmm. um, I have to call him later, actually. Um, anyway, the, what do you think, what do you think is going to happen in Islington North since we're here? Will, will Paul Mason <laughs> be Jeremy Corbyn? He missed his chance. He didn't get selected. You know who I, did? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, I he was no, 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 no. Labour, Labour have um, poor Paul Mason. He missed out again. You know, I think it was his fifth attempt. No way. To be a, a Starmerite Labour candidate, but no, sadly, we we won't uh, be rewarded with the you know the spectacle of of Paul Mason there at the count <laughs> in Islington North on on, on polling day. But uh, no, it's going to be. Um, Jeremy Corbyn versus Praful Nalgund, who is a local councillor and um, he, he runs with his mother a private healthcare business. I think that tells you... Sounds like a perfect Labour candidate. Yeah, I think that tells you all you need to know about um, the sort of candidate that, that the Starmer machine would prefer and the sort of candidate that would run against Jeremy Corbyn in his own seat that he's represented since 1983. Yeah. No, I don't want to tempt fate, but I, I think Jeremy will win. I don't think he's going to lose. Put it that I, way. I think um, I, I was getting nervous because he, he wasn't announcing. Because 
even though he's he's uh, very much loved in Islington North, I thought there was a bit of communications work to be done to, to get out to the message to all the regular Labour voters that actually this election is different. If you want Jeremy, you have to put your cross not in the Labour box. You have mm. to vote independent. So I was getting a bit nervous that he, he wasn't officially declaring. He's declared now. Um, and, you know, so many people are going to volunteer for that campaign. He's going to be... Uh, his campaign team are going to be overwhelmed, hopefully, by thousands of people from all over the country wanting to volunteer. Um, his team, this was dropped through my door in Holloway recently. His team have produced a very, uh, very classy looking uh, leaflet, which, you know, sets out the case very well, talks about all the stuff he's done over the years for Islington North. I think it's very good. Do you mind if I see that? Yeah, take a look. And it's got all these endorsements on the back from local people and uh, ex labor councillors. And so I'll be, um, it's his election to lose, I think. I think it will be a massive psychological setback for the left if he loses. I mean, it'll be a total disaster, to be honest. He is, he is, remains the figurehead for the left, he remains the sort of uh, moral leader of the left. If he loses, it will be devastating uh, and the, the Labour right won't shut up about it for the next sort of 20 years. No, but I so, think he will. So we've got to be, we've got for, to be the Labour candidate. He's had that constituent. Well, I think I looked it up. It was like, but it's like, an, like 80% of a vote or something approaching that in the last one. It's funny, since he announced, um, I've seen three camera crews on the streets around Finsbury Park talking to passers-by. Um, they're obviously not very imaginative, these, um, these different media groups. They've all got the same idea, which is to vox pop his constituents, to just ask them, you know, what, what do you think now that, he's, now that he's declared, now that he's going to run as an independent? And look, these, these people would obviously love to find people who are saying, you know, no way, I'm voting, I'm voting for the other guy. But it's so hard for them to, mm. to find those people. You know, they, they just come across all these really... Um, loyal, enthusiastic local voters, who many of whom have their own personal story about how they've been helped by Jeremy at some point over the years. So look, if you get out that vote, he should be fine. It'll be much more challenging for uh, other independent socialist candidates and, and small parties like Transform who don't have that name recognition yet. Um, but they've just got to work really hard in the six weeks that we have. Hmm. So what are your, what are your like, hopes for the election campaign yourselves, like what would be an ideal outcome? Yeah, so for the Transform Party, I think the six week uh, election campaign is an opportunity to um, sort of build ourselves up as an organization. Obviously, we're, we're standing a, a small number of candidates. I hope they do well. I don't think they'll realistically be Transform MPs. Um, not trying to be, uh, you know, too pessimistic, but uh, I think we're not we're not completely deluded about that. Obviously, um, there's lots of work to be done on on name recognition and just getting our name out there. If we can keep our deposits in those seats, um, get you know a result which is sort of respectable. What is and the, what's the threshold for keeping your keeping uh, your deposit? Your the threshold deposit. is is five percent. Five percent. Okay. Yeah. So that's where you can sort of, as a small party, as a new party, I think you can sort of hold your head up and say, you know, that that was respectable. So what, um, what constituencies are you standing? Do you know uh, exactly which ones? Yeah. Um, so they're, it's, um, they're both their neighbouring constituencies in the northeast, actually. Uh, one is Bishop Auckland, and the other, I just have to remind myself, because it used to be Sedgefield, Tony Blair's old seat, and it's got a new long oh, really? name now. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, it's ironic, <laughs> isn't it? The new one is Newton, Acliffe, and Spennymore. So we have Brian Agar running uh, in that latter constituency, and Rachel Morn in Bishop Auckland. And these are... Um, I'm just so delighted that these are transform candidates. These are local working class people who um, have not a shred of ego or careerism um, in them. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're doing this because they really care about their communities. They really care about promoting socialist policies and giving people a real choice, uh, not just the sort of fake choice between you know, a red tie or a blue tie at the general election. Yeah, I think that's the most frustrating part. Like, why aren't you running in Tar Hamlets where I am? That would give me someone to at least consider voting for. I have no idea who I'm going to, like, I have 
no. Don't. Well, we'll keep an eye out because there's there's so many um, you know independent candidates emerging, and especially you know that part of London has such a history of uh, challenges to Labour. So off the top of my head, I don't know which. Um, I don't think Tower Hamlets is a constituency. No. I, um, so off the top of my head, I don't I don't know who who your options are, but there probably will be you know a sort of challenge to Labour mm. where you are. Be nice. Maybe they'll get my protest vote. Yeah. <laughs> or spoil the yeah. ballot. Go in and just like scribble all over it. I've always kind of wanted to do that. I've done you know that I mean? before. Just go in there, like, I've done that before. It feels. <laughs> it, no, no. It it feels it feels really good, and uh, I don't think it's a wasted vote. You know, people talk about a protest vote. Well, sometimes protest is really important. Protest is a really important part of democracy. If you feel like uh, casting a protest vote, you know that I think that's a legitimate form of protest. I think um, in the local elections in 2020. No, I think or twenty. No, I think 2021 because they were delayed because of the pandemic. Um, I really had no uh, wish to endorse anyone on that ballot paper in, in my local election. So I think I just wrote "fuck Keir Starmer," <laughs> uh, and it you know it felt really good. Politics is about much more than just making yourself feel good. But you know that 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 did that did feel good. I'm sure it did. That would be nice. Maybe it's just right. Or you could like really try and freak them out. Like so on the on the ballot paper, you like help. I've been st- I've been trapped in this place, like right, right fake address on the thing for a little. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get creative. Oh. I, I've been at a count. Uh, I was at. I mean, I was at the Sobel Leisure Centre in Islington North on the night of the, uh, the general election in 2019. So I, I basically witnessed the defeat of the Corbyn project. Mm. It's not a very. Uh, it's a bit of a depressing sort of uh, historical claim, mm. but. Um, yeah, so I was uh, overseeing some of the ballots as they came in, and you, you know, you get all sorts of stuff. You know, you get some really funny stuff. Um, yeah, lots of um, lots of drawings of genitalia. Uh, really? also, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But also all sorts of protests. Some quite sort of eccentric reasons for not voting. You know, people. But 2019, I think, was a less hopeful mood than 2017 because. People had been convinced to to hate Jeremy Corbyn as 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 well as as well as the Conservatives, you know. So, yeah. sadly, Boris had a better slogan. He did have a good slogan, um, but you know, he also had politics on easy mode, as we say. You know, he had the backing of the press, and no one was really, um, you know, quizzing him about his terrible record on anything. So he had he had quite an easy ride to to number ten, really. No, he really did. I think he'll come back. You th- that's that's your 2025 prediction no well the of, the no 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 i there needs to be another another parliament okay so he'll, he'll be back after one failed term of summerism yeah okay so 2030 but, but there, 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 there are diehard boris johnson fans he sees out, himself out there Churchill. Absolutely, and he's still very popular and uh, like amongst the membership yeah 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 despite his complete incompetence yeah him and him and um Farage, mm. you know. Farage is, I think, the most popular politician in Britain. Uh, him and him really? and Corbyn, like really? right up there. Yeah, I guess like, pe- people. Did you see yeah. Farage won the the journalist of the year as voted by the British public? Journalist of the yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. He's like broadcast is, journalist is, is of the year. Is he a journalist? Oh, what? Like because a, of GB News? Yeah, he got voted as ju- broadcast journalist of the year. Like okay. that. That shows you how popular he is, though. Oh, and the revolving door between journalism and politics as well. Yeah, too. It's. I mean, that, honestly, it disgusts me that any MP has a has a TV show like any. Of the, yeah, any it's wrong. It's MP. wrong, and it didn't used to be the case. No. You know, this is this is a new. Uh, this is an innovation which which we should really be critical of. I think. Like LBC as well. They're both. They're both at it. Uh, uh, Lammy's got his yeah. show on LBC. Mm-hmm. Isn't he? I don't think uh, like what. Well, Get the fuck out of here! Like, go, yeah, like, go to your constituency. Like, yeah, go you, read you should the be, fucking legislation that yeah, you're voting he on. Should go, be, he should be answering like, the questions, not asking them. Yeah, Absolutely. and like any of those pricks that are like uh, politicians that have shows on GB News, like what's his name, yeah. Jake Rees Mogg, um, Lee Anderson. Does he have a show? Maybe on GB News. I mean, you'll be shocked to hear I don't That's sort of consume stun- loads stun- of this stunning, kind though, of media. Yeah. So, but, yeah. um, but I, I can't, I can't fathom. Like, do you think they'll do anything? Do you think Keir Starmer do anything about the the, the second job thing? Like, <laughs> like, yeah, I know, I know, it's, it's, it's. But like, okay, right. I have so to laugh if you were going to go on your big uh, list of like yeah. things that could happen that would mm. help the country, right? Things that are like basic, and most people would like uh, 
agree on be like even if it's just make the trains cheaper however you say that happens just like make the train or yeah. if, like if you go on the big list of like things that you're like not possible and you go way down and you go well could we pick an achievable one maybe if you thought stop the mps having two jobs like i don't think you'll do that i think uh as with the you know the new labor administration of, of blair and brown you know i, I think there will be a, a couple of policies that will you know, not be particularly offensive. Um, depending on how the economy grows, they may plow a bit more money into public services. You know, maybe they'll give a bit more money to NHS. They yeah, say they're going to... If they continue with everything being, like, privatised in the way it is and the, the way the, the contract bidding works, like, more money doesn't equal more money being spent on the public service itself. Sure, sure. And, and where's streeting, you know, is the the high priest of NHS privatization. You know, he, he keeps he keeps bragging about how far he'll go in terms of these partnerships with the private sector. Um, so, you know, we may see the NHS transformed beyond recognition under a Starmer government in a way which we haven't really seen before. Yeah, and he said he wouldn't put a stop to the privatization either. So even in the, in, like, because the, the problem that we have at the minute is like the Tories keep saying, oh, we're spending more money than ever before. And yeah. that's true. Like they are, they are actively spending more than ever before. I mean, that's slightly skewed because like inflation, etc., and like population growth and the number of taxpayers, blah, blah, blah. But like broadly, they are spending more money, except less and less of it is actually being seen on the ground by the people who, you know, like nurses, doctors, mm. porters, like the, all of the people who have a general impact on the actual service you receive, yeah. provide yeah. are not like seeing that extra money spent. It's going to, you know, um, shareholders and yeah, accountants, cons consultants. Um, consultants yeah. um, it makes its way through probably 17 different, like, entities before it actually re reaches the, the thing that's providing the service in the first place. And that, you Sure. Know. And, and this is a good example of, you know, we talked before about, you know, what does Keir Starmer actually believe in? What, what the actual politics of the, of the labour rights, you know, as opposed to what they're just doing out of pragmatism? Um, the principle of the NHS as a, a public service, you know, tr truly public, is really popular. Um, so you'd think it'd be a no-brainer if if Starmer's whole uh, project is just about doing stuff that's popular. Mm. You'd think that would be a no-brainer. And yet, you actually ha what do you have instead? You have Wes Streeting, the, the darling of private healthcare companies. You have a private healthcare candidate running against Jeremy Corbyn. One could only conclude that their actual politics mm. are you know, pro privatization of healthcare, which is like the, the problem, the problem, my problem with it is just the worst of both worlds, right? You see, if they said, okay, we're going to like have the system totally private, like they do in like a number of European countries, I'd be like, okay, like try with, with, with an insurance yeah. system. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'd be like, look, I'd prefer that not to be the way, but I would actually actively prefer that to the hybrid model that we have at the minute where the money is publicly spent on a public service but provided by corporations to whom we have no say yeah, yeah. and whom have no accountability to the public all that it does is you're, they're farming out responsibility with no oversight no like no like public yeah no public oversight no way to go hey to go to your mp and be like you know, the, the hospital down the road, this yeah. thing was unacceptable. Oh, well, it was farmed out to publicists or like... Yeah, know. I mean, they love that model. I mean, it's the same with like uh, academy schools, isn't it? You know, I don't think Keir Starmer's government is going to bring academies back under the oversight of local authorities. That would be too much democracy. Oh, uh, anyway, uh, before we wrap up, is there anything else you would like to say about transform politics, like things you'd like to point people towards? Um, resources, social um, medias. Yeah, the Transform Party is a very new party. Uh, we have over a thousand paying members. We're growing. We're doing lots of really exciting stuff at the moment. You know, partly prompted by the election campaign. We've selected candidates. We're developing policies. We're developing our comms across social media and everywhere else. Um, and. You should check out our website, transformpolitics.uk, um, which is going to be uh, new and shiny in a few weeks with added features. You should check us out on social media. 
if you are feeling cynical, if you're feeling uh, bitter about the lack of meaningful democratic choice at this election, and you don't think uh, we should just tweak around the edges, you think in order to do things that are worthwhile in this country, in order to eradicate poverty, in order to give every child the best start in life, in order to actually beat the housing crisis, we need more radical change, socialist policies, you should consider joining Transform and building that credible alternative that we so desperately need. Well, that's a lovely way to, to wrap things up. Uh, Jackson, thanks very much for your time. Thanks for having me, Josh. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. No problem. Links for everything in the description below. Thanks for making it right the way to the end of the podcast. I love that you tuned in this long. Do me a favor, hit subscribe because 80% of you bastards are not subscribing, but you're watching my videos. See you next time.